This video is my grade rationale for Module 2, um, and I give myself an A for assignment submitted, interaction with my fellow cohort members, and um, information, uh, reading, the readings here for our um, lesson on this week, or the past two weeks. Um, and I must say, this lesson has really hit home. This module has really hit home for me. I have internalized this module. I have used it to reflect on my own life, both personally and professionally, um, to see where changes need to be made uh, to the point where I bought um, a journal because I intend to make this a practice in my life. Um, and it's, it's important. And I really appreciate this lesson, these, this module on a personal level. And um, I would like to start off by saying that it's this module that has brought a quote to life for me. Um, starting with my undergrad career, um, and I'd heard this quote over and over again, and one of our articles references it, uh, the quote by Socrates, that the unexamined life isn't worth living. And it is this module that has really turned on the proverbial light bulb for me as it pertains to that quote. Um, you know, because up until now, that quote was just been right over my head. Um, but I understand it, or at least have my own interpretation of it, where we know all lives are worth their breath, they're worth living. But knowing that someone who doesn't take the time to just look at their lives, look at the decisions that they've made, um, and not just to think about them and do nothing, but to think about them and make changes, to make improvements. Those are people who are just existing um, and not living. And that's what we want to do. We want to live on purpose, knowing that our lives have, has, our lives have the potential of uh, affecting others lives in a positive way and those who choose not to reflect those who choose to live the unexamined life um, goes along with this quote here and this is the quote that I used to um, in my module one grade rationale and it is without reflection without thinking back on what we've done or where we're going or what we want to be we go blindly on our way we're just floating on creating more unintended consequences and failing to achieve anything useful and creating more unintended consequences because things are going to happen as a result of our living as a result of our existing you know and we can say well i didn't mean for that to happen well did you do anything for it not to happen and so that's what that means to me. And that's what that quote, the unexamined life was just really, has just really opened up to me this week. Um, and I just really have been touched by this week's lesson. And so um, our learning outcomes for this week is describe, compare, and synthesize leadership theories and be able to differentiate and discuss how they manifest in various types of institutions. And all of these thoughts, all of these philosophers, all of these ideas, all of these opinions, I'm sure show up in every way and in every um, institution um, because we want to invoke reflection. We want people to think about what they're doing and they're going to show up in our institutions because we want to improve. We want change. Um, it causes us to look back on our practice. We are practitioners. It causes us to look on our practices. It causes us to look back over our experiences to see what can be changed what other alternatives are out there for us to address this problem or for us to address or improve this process. So they show up 
in so many different ways. And um, while there are some differences in some of the opinions of the philosophers who were presented to us this week, they all come together with one thing in mind, and that is how important reflection is. We have to critically reflect. And um, there are no ifs, there are no buts about this. We have as we have to, as effective practitioners, look at where we were because we are all a sum total of our experiences. Our institutions, our colleges, our universities are all just a sum total of experiences. Uh, our practices that we have came about because somebody thought, hey, this needs to change. Our practice needs to change here. The process needs to change here. We need to add this. We need to take away that. So all of our institutions are just the sum total of the experiences that have gone on there. And as a result of the leadership of those uh, institutions, because as uh, leadership changes, philosophies change practices change where one provost may be adamant about advisors professional advisors another provost may come in and say hey faculty needs to advise so just using that as an example every institution where it is now just as we are personally is a sum total of their experiences and so the um some of the Philosophers that were mentioned uh, were Bacon, Descartes, Locke, Kant, um, Van Manen, Max Van Manen, and Schoen or Sean. Um, and so they present some very great ideas about reflection, and a lot of them coincide with each other. And I wanted to use as the definition here in the Tannenbaum uh, essay that reflection in the field of education carries the connotation of deliberation. And a lot of times when I hear the word deliberation, it is in relation to a court trial. And we know that um, when the jury goes in to deliberate, they've been presented with an experience, an alleged experience by the person who's been charged. Based on that experience, knowledge, they are presented with knowledge from that alleged experience. And they had to take that knowledge and make a decision about that knowledge and that alleged experience. And that decision, hopefully the right one, based on knowledge, based on evidence, is going to affect the life of that person who's been charged. Same thing with us as uh, in our personal lives, in our professional lives. Uh, as practitioners, we are presented with experiences. With those experiences, we gain knowledge. And with that knowledge, we have to make decisions. And when we make those decisions, those decisions as practitioners in higher education or in any field that we find ourselves is going to affect our lives and the lives of others. So we have to look back on things. We have to look back and see what difference could have been made and was I ready to make it, you know, and I think that comes as we get into leadership styles, you know, being ready to make those necessary decisions for change and improvement. And so a lot of the philosophers here bring that up. And um, Dewey, he talks about the only worthwhile thought is the reflective thought. And that just really goes back to how I opened up here that the reflective thought in the definition of reflection here is a thought that has purpose and it has intent. That reflective thought has intent, not just to be a thought, but that action is going to come behind it. So the only worthwhile thought is the thought that you have that's going to invoke change. It's going to bring change for the betterment and improvement of others. Um, and he says, what an individual has learned in the way of knowledge and skill in one situation becomes an instrument of understanding and dealing effectively with situations which follow. And so that goes back to the reflective video, how 
It talks about gaining the knowledge from that experience and understanding what could have been done differently from that experience, but then using that knowledge to help you with future experiences. And um, understanding and dealing effectively with the situations that follow. And so once again, talking about reflective, the reflective video and also the discussion, one of my cohort members, um, fellow cohort members, Brian, when he, he addressed the, um, the case study that we had this week and how the president, what can the president do? Even though his campus has been peaceful, what can he do to prevent uh, certain hot topic situations from boiling over on his campus? And so what Brian did, he addressed that situation, but he also brought up a point where um, the president should implement a plan or policy or procedure that will last way after he's no longer the president. So something that look at the situations that's happening on other campuses. So that's an experience. Gain knowledge from those things that are happening on those other campuses and come up with an, a solution, a plan that's going to better your campus that may even prevent these types of things from happening on your campus and then setting it in place where it can improve or be able to address situations that come up in the future long after Dr. Smith is no longer the president of that institution. So you can gain knowledge from that experience. Um, use that knowledge to see how can things be different right here in this experience or in the present here, but also be able to use that experience to help you as you move forward. Um, and as we um, have the potential, and of course, you know, other things are going to come on up, future experiences, so being able to address future experiences. And so the next one in our lesson or the next other uh, philosopher that was heavily uh, referenced was Max Van Manen. And he focused on teacher empowerment by focusing on the three levels of reflection, which is technical, looking at just the means of things, uh, practical um, reflection, uh, being able to question assumptions, uh, question beliefs, and come up with solutions uh, or different perspectives from those questions. And then the critical reflection, how that embodies both technical and practical reflection. And it says here that practitioners become autonomous and empowered as they move up that hierarchy that Van Manen uh, referenced, as he, that he um, developed. And so going back to the reflective video, it stated that when you have an experience, you've gained the knowledge from that experience and you can't do anything about it, that brings frustration. But if you have an experience, you've gained knowledge from that experience and you can do something about it now and in the future, that empowers you. And so that's what Max Van Manen was saying, that when teachers or practitioners can move up that hierarchy from technical to practical to critical, which encompasses both technical and practical, then they're empowered to make a change. They have the knowledge, they have the, the, the know-how to um, look at things differently and implement the best possible solution uh, for that situation and moving forward into other future situations. And Sean, or Sean, Sean, um, he was talking about developing practitioners who frame uh, and contemplate, who frame problems, contemplate experiences, and work with experts to improve practice. And this was something, too, because his ideas not only work in education, they work with other fields. Um, and he reflects on the practical common knowledge and moves away from Dewey science-based reflection because um, Dewey is heavily based in science. And I remember coming up in school, the scientific method um, and how he uses, um, you know, coming up with hypotheses. 
Um, we know that um, hypotheses are like experiments. You know, here's a hypothesis. This is what I'm thinking will work. Let me experiment and see if it is going to work. And if it's not going to work, let's, let's try something else. And so, and they were saying that that was, you know, a lot of too theoretical and not practical were shown is practical. He's about putting the, the, the hand to the plow, so to speak. Um, and he talks about how universities, research universities, are giving their students professional knowledge, but they don't have the technical knowledge to carry out what it is that they already know. And so that's what Schoen uh, was emphasizing. And I think he, he did a really good job, but it all comes, he did a really good job, like, I mean, he's a philosopher, right? Um, but he, he, he explains well uh, about helping develop those who can frame problems. Okay, here's a problem. Let's come up with a problem. Let's, let's come up with something that we may face in the future. I may not even be facing it right now, but who can, you can come up with something and come up with ideas and plans and different perspectives on how to address that. And not just having the professional knowledge here, but having the, the practicality of it, being able to put it in action, being able to put it, uh, in movement, you know, so that's where Sean is. Um, and it says in relation to Dewey, he's more practical and about application based. He does draw a conclusion. These are my notes here. He does draw uh, a comparison to Dewey and Descartes in that problems should be viewed as an opportunity to improve. You know, not just, oh man, I got a problem and I'm going to go stick my head in the sand and hope you know, that that problem goes away. No. Uh, and just as, um, Dr. Grabing had mentioned in one of her, uh, online lectures that a problem should be seen as an opportunity, not as something to run away from, not as something to shy away from. A problem should be seen as, yes, this is my time to, to do something here. And, um, there was something in the reading where, yes, here, it says, Dewey, in this sense, shown mirror the sentiments of both Dewey and Descartes, both of whom found problems and disequilibrium as being a welcome state of mind. And, you know, a lot of times when we are, when our equilibrium is off, oh, boy, we want to get in panic mode. But they're talking about when problems arise, just as uh, referencing Dr. Graving, when problems arise, when things are off balance, when things aren't working, that's the time to welcome that state of mind. Because that's an opportunity, as Dewey says, to metaphorically climb a tree to find some standpoint form which we may survey additional facts and thus make more reasonable and educated decisions. You know, and I think that's, that's unique. Instead of running away from a problem, be confident enough to say, hey, well, here's a problem. What can we do to fix this problem? And, um, and it says practical application based on, uh, let's see, he says he does draw comparison once again to Dewey and Descartes and that problems should be viewed as an opportunity to improve, to invoke change, to bring about change. And Sean says that universities must teach students both theoretical and practical strategies because theory and practice go together. You can't have one without the other. And there's a, uh, quote about that, but, um, I can't find it at this time, but uh, also uh, in our readings, we were uh, introduced to constructivism, and constructivism is when we can take our old way of thinking and come up with some new ideas with new knowledge and how they merge together. It says, um, educational, the educational approach of constructivism involves the integration of new ideas with previous experiences 
and it seeks to change existing cognitive structures by allowing students to explore and discover new alternatives. And so when you can construct knowledge, you know, using your old experiences and having new, um, new alternatives, you know, bringing all of that together. Um, and it also talked about the role of leadership theory and how leaders and the constructivist approach, the constructivist approach empowers students to, to take responsibility of their own learning. It says the best leaders encourage followers to feel independent, confident, powerful, and capable. Thus, leaders can motivate and enhance the ability of followers to challenge existing views. You know, so the leadership theory takes their students so they can challenge existing views. Um, and that was something, too, in our reading that just really um, stuck with me here. What Dewey was talking about. And it says here, do we note it that the only worthwhile thought was that which was reflective, thereby identifying thinking with the analytic process guided by a hypothesis testing mode of problem solving. And that's a reference to kind of the scientific theory and how he's so scientific. Uh, but it says further, and this is what really got me. He stressed the importance of reflection by describing its ability to enable practitioners to use evaluation and analysis to rise above tradition, authority, and circumstance. Reflection empowers, and that's just comparing it with both this, um, reading it here, and this uh, article here, Reflection gives us the ability, it enables us as practitioners to use evaluation and analysis to rise above tradition. Hey, just because we've always done it, does it like that? Does it mean we need to continue to do it like that? Um, <clears throat> to rise above authority. You know, that's questionable, especially when it comes to public universities and uh, public institutions. But it gives you, hey, it gives me the power to, to go to those who are in authority, though, and question, hey, okay, even though we've always done it like this, let's look at some old, some uh, uh, different methods um, and above circumstance. In essence, it causes us to want to rise above the status quo, to rise above what we've always been used to, to rise above you know, just, just the, the mundane stuff, the stuff that is just always equal, you know, the stuff that we want to change. And as I move on to the next learning outcome, this, this is what got me to, and this is Dewey. So he's been my favorite this week. It says here, Dewey noted Reflection as being a holistic experience that is neither procedural nor appropriate for every situation in the classroom. Rather, he described reflective practice as incorporating careful consideration, active decision making, and persistence toward an unattainable conclusion. And how I interpret that is that as we continue to reflect, to make changes, to improve, to look for alternative um, scenarios, to look for alternative choices, we should persist toward an unattainable conclusion, meaning in our reflection, we should never get to a point where we say, I've arrived that this is it. I don't have to do any more thinking. I don't have to do any more improving. I don't have to look for, I don't have to look for any other alternative situations. So, because we persist toward an unattainable conclusion, meaning we're always striving for what's best. We're always striving for what's new. We're always striving for what's innovative. And that's, 
I'm telling you, this list really hit home for me. When Rosalind Tor Torres in our um, uh, presentation, The Makings of a, a Leader, um, she talked about being able to even change um, practices that have shown themselves to be effective. You know, we have to be always looking to improve, always looking to be better, always persistent toward an unattainable conclusion. That blew my mind there because there should never be a time where we say in our practice as practitioners, as professionals, that I've reached that pinnacle. Because even in this doctoral program, and you know, the EDD is like the terminal degree here in our field, that doesn't stop you from continuing to educate yourself. So once I've walked across that stage at Maryville University, that doesn't mean that my education stops. That doesn't mean that I stop wanting to be better. That doesn't mean that I stop looking for things to improve my practice. That doesn't mean that I stop wanting to affect the lives of others. That doesn't mean that I want to stop being intentional, that I want to stop being purposeful. That doesn't mean that. That means that I'm striving towards an unattainable conclusion. That means that as long as I have breath in my body, there's always going to be an opportunity to improve, to change, and to affect the lives of others. There are like 7 billion people in this world. So it's going to take me a long time to reach all of them. So that's the end of that learning outcome. Our second learning outcome was practice reflective writing based on self-assessment and self-knowledge of personal leadership strengths, styles, and theories. And so um, I point to the reflective writing activity that we had um, and a lot of things that uh, went along with that. Let's see and how I feel my learning style or my leadership style is. And I took some um, leadership assessment online and my leadership leans towards that of a diplomat. And um, I want to always incorporate other people's feelings, how they feel about certain situations. And I always feel like everybody has a voice. Everybody has a seat at the table. It might not be the big table with the presidents and the vice presidents and the deans and the associate deans, but everybody sits at a table. The table I sit at may be small as an advisor, but I still sit at that table and I still want to hear everybody else's ideas about what we're facing, the processes that we have to follow through with. And so those are, that's my learning style. So I, I point to that. And let me see if I can get it pulled up here. And a lot of things that I know that I need to change or improve upon. Um, I question sometimes my ability to lead, and that's something that I've been reflecting on as a part of um, this module. And wanting to develop as a leader wanting to develop um, and be who I have in mind. And I have this, this idea in mind of who I want to be. And in my reflective paper, um, I talk about uh, reflective leadership and how it is a way of approaching the work of being a leader by leading one's life with presence and personal mastery. And I have in this, these last two weeks, really thought about being present in my life and what does personal mastery look like in my life, being self-aware and reflecting on my own experiences and experiences of others. Um, in this, I looked inwardly and um, I quoted Ethel Kennedy and she talked about or has a a quote that says introspection. I hate it. So to be introspective is to examine one's own thoughts and feelings. And in our reading, um, 
it talks about how some leaders don't want to look at themselves. They don't want to evaluate themselves. They don't want to reflect because they're faced then with their flaws. They're faced with the imperfections. They're faced with all of that. And um, sometimes looking inwardly is the only way that we're going to be able to move forward. And so, um, going back also, I referenced Ro Rosalind Torres in the TED Talk um, and how she stated that we must be able to understand that we have the power. And that's what I need to realize, that we have the power to extract the essential meaning slash most important aspects of our lives discover where things aren't coming together and do what is necessary to change and improve those areas and so in this paper also some of my strengths um i'm open-minded um i think i can see things from multiple perspectives or would like to think that i put myself in other people's shoes um and i love to collaborate as much as my introversion will allow me, and I need to come out of that too. I love to collaborate because you don't, my brother has often quoted that if I'm the smartest person in the room, I'm in the wrong room. I need to be able to collaborate. I need to be able to hear um, other people's ideas. And as a leader, um, depending on the type of leader a person is, I think it's always important to hear what other people around you are saying you know, and you, and as a leader, you may be the one to make that final decision. But even with that, hearing what other people have to say, um, because other people in colleges and universities, um, in other places of businesses, even in our personal lives, other people are affected by the decisions that we make. And we have to be mindful of that. And so I want to develop as pointing once again to this paper, I want to develop more uh, as a confident person. I do believe that I have the ability to lead. I think my style at this time doesn't put me in a place where, and you know, I may be underestimating myself, to, to be who I want to be, where I see myself as. So there's a lot of growth that needs to take place in my life in my life um, our next portion our next learning outcome is give examples and reflect on current leadership challenges institutional leaders face from internal and external forces and relate to own leadership style there are a lot of leadership challenges that uh, institutional leaders face um, and I think when I was going back over that Dewey quote, that reflection causes us to um, challenge authority, not necessarily challenge authority, but to rise above it, but, so to speak. Um, but institutional leaders have a lot of challenges. Um, starting with especially public institutions um, those entities that govern public institutions um, the state boards of regents um, as such comprehensive universities and the partnerships that they have with um, communities outwardly you know a lot of times they face those types of challenges where and that's something that I thought too, that if you're innovative, if you want to make changes, sometimes you're stymied by the powers that be. Um, and those are things that can stand in the way. And a lot of uh, accrediting boards, so a lot of these things, states challenges, board of regents challenges, your commitment to your community, those types of challenges, um, faculty challenges, um, so many things that can stand in the way of wanting to do something different, of 
wanting to be um, uh, innovative. Um, a lot of things. So those are some of the challenges there. And support and value differences in cohort members, experiences, backgrounds, and perspectives through civil and respectful discussion. And with that, I point to um, the discussions that I participated in this week. Um, and Jamie is the one who got me doing videos, uh, and I, I appreciate that from her. And just having that dialogue about um, what she would do as far as the, the, the case study that we have with Dr. Smith. And she stated how in her initial post, how she doesn't see herself as a leader. And I kind of said in there that I didn't either, but I was certainly referring to myself and not her. Um, but she talked about how she would manage that, that situation. Number one, she would reflect on her own beliefs. And I thought that was critical because when you are handling situations like that, when you're doing situ you're handling situations uh, such as race, LGBTQ issues, religious freedoms, all types of things. When you're the academic leader having to deal with those challenges, we have to be careful not to react or respond out of our own beliefs and assumptions because we have to realize that everybody doesn't believe and assume things the way we do. And so when she said that she would have to, number one, evaluate who she is, what she believes before um, responding was critical to me. And I thought she was spot on with that. Secondly, she said that she would collaborate with uh, other people who would definitely have a voice in that conversation, such as, um, you know, officials on campus, um, students, which is critical because, you know, if these things are happening on campus, guess what? They're probably the majority of them are going to be your students. All of these uprisings are starting with your students. And so she said that she would uh, reach out to the students. And I think that's important too, because in our readings, it says that the leader has to be in tune with his followers' perspectives, his or her perspective. The leader, he or she, has to be in tune with their followers' perspectives. And in situations like that, the president does need to be able to hear from his or her students and know what they're thinking, what their feelings are in situations like that. And lastly, she said that her challenges would be to look at herself. Her challenge would be to question our beliefs because a lot of times we don't want to look at ourselves. A lot of times we just want to go with the flow. We want to go what we believe, but when we're leading people from all different types of backgrounds, all different types of beliefs, all different types of whatever, we have to be careful not to alienate anyone and to make sure that all of our members of our campus feel like they have a voice where they can express themselves respectfully um, and have the freedom to do so all while um, not um, infringing upon the rights of others. And so this brings my almost 40 minute grade rationale to a close. Um, and I just really want to get across that. I really enjoyed this lesson. This lesson really hit home for me. And um, I'm just uh, thankful for this opportunity to be a part of this program and to and to learn as much as I can. So thank you, Grade Rationale, for um, Module 2, and I have given myself an A. Thank you.